Hi everyone, welcome back to Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm Dave Thompson. Uh, it's my privilege today to be joined by Harold Holzer, who is the chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation, as well as a Roger Hertog Fellow at the New York Historical Society. You all know him, however, as a Lincoln scholar, one of the country's leading authors on Abraham Lincoln and political culture of the Civil War era. Uh, Harold has authored, co-authored, and edited 46 books. I won't list them all here, but a couple of my personal favorites, uh, Lincoln President-Elect, Abraham Lincoln and the Great Secession Winter 1860 to 1861, as well as Lincoln at Cooper Union, the speech that made Abraham Lincoln president. So, Harold, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Now, as we turn our calendar over into November, uh, and our sesquicentennial calendar moves into November uh, of 1863, uh, obviously we're rapidly approaching the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So I wonder if, if you could just share with us perhaps some of your thoughts pertaining to the Gettysburg Address as we approach it 150 years on, uh, this very seminal moment in Lincoln's presidency that we still look at uh, fondly, um, but I wonder just if you could share some of your thoughts uh, with regards to it. As we speak, I guess I'm a little down on this sesquicentennial because I, like other people who are gathering at Gettysburg uh, that weekend for the Lincoln Forum, you know I'm the vice chairman of the Lincoln Forum, work with Frank Williams uh, on organizing, this is our 18th symposium at Gettysburg, and um, I guess we'd all been hoping that President Obama was going to be the speaker. And uh, they just announced that he, in fact, will not be there. So the wind is a little bit out of the balloon. And uh, we're, we're sort of um, trying to turn our thoughts to the Lincoln assessment only, losing this great opportunity. As, by the way, they lost President Kennedy. Uh, a little piece of um, disturbing trivia, I guess, for the 100th anniversary President Kennedy had been uh, scheduled uh, up until the last minute to be the speaker and actually sent word that he needed to go to Texas for a uh, political, uh, a series of political events, tragically. Um, it's what they call in New York a Kinahara. So Barack Obama has to be careful because there's bad luck attached to these cancellations. I'm sure he will be. Um, it, it, it causes us to reflect on more on Lincoln and less, I guess, on current politics, um, how a speech can sort of um, define a sacrifice, um, how it can help uh, justify the kind of tragedy that the country was going through at the time, and how the most unexpected of uh, presidential declarations can live, as the Chicago Tribune of the time said, in the annals of the war and beyond. Um, it's still wonderful to go to Gettysburg, to ride along the streets that Lincoln rode on the way to the cemetery, to go in that very hushed and uh, hallowed space, and to imagine it filled with 10,000 people 150 years ago, waiting, maybe not so much to hear Lincoln, but to see him. The President of the United States on a road trip was a very rare occurrence in 1863. For you, what do you view really as kind of the big Lincoln moment of the war. I, I don't know if you can actually pinpoint one. Is it perhaps you know, the Gettysburg Address that's rather timely? Is it his assassination and the aftermath? You know, obviously recently with Steven Spielberg's film, we've seen so much behind, you know, behind right. the scenes of the 13th Amendment. So I wonder if it's n none of those for you, if perhaps it's something else. But I wonder for you, what do you view really as, as kind of a seminal moment for Lincoln? Well, I, I view the seminal moments as a series of steps. Mm -hmm. You were kind enough to mention uh, Cooper Union. Uh, clearly, had he not delivered something unexpectedly brilliant, amusing, compelling, that also worked in print in New York City, in his debut speech in New York City, he wouldn't have elevated himself to the position of contending for the Republican presidential nomination a few months later when the delegates convened in Chicago. So you have to start there. And of course, I have for several reasons, a proprietary interest in, in Cooper Union, not just because of the book, but because, you know, it's here in New York City. It's our one great Lincoln site in New York City. In addition, by the way, to City Hall, not far away, where Abraham Lincoln um, uh, greeted a hostile pro-secessionist mayor in 1861 across George Washington's desk and told him, 
in no uncertain terms, he better give up his dream of having New York City secede from the Union. So Cooper Union, and I'll tell you, the, the first inaugural, which I think is unfairly or maybe not unfairly, but expectedly uh, d- kept in the background in terms of historical memory because of how extraordinarily special the second inaugural was. But the first inaugural bears rereading and rehearing. It is a, uh, a cry for unity and uh, uh, peace, contains a lot of concessions and some awfully beautiful words as well. But if I had, I mean, if I had to be at one event, I guess, even though it would be over too quickly for my taste, I would choose Gettysburg. Uh, because, not only because it's, I think, still the apex of his creative genius as a writer, but because I'm dying to know the answers to all the unanswered uh, myths. Did people applaud or didn't they applaud? Did they cry or didn't they cry? Did he read or did he recite? Uh, was he showing signs of coming down with smallpox, which overcame him a few hours later, or was he vigorous? Could he be heard in the back or couldn't he be heard? And why didn't that photographer take a picture? What took him so long? You don't need three minutes to take a picture. All of, I'd love to know the answers. And so even though I part of me says hang out at a longer event because you get to see more of them, that's the best. So I would, I guess I would choose that. Now, how would you personally assess the sesquicentennial so far in terms of how, how we're commemorating it? We're here about halfway through, obviously, chronologically at least, uh, of the war's events. Um, how, how do you feel we're doing uh, as a nation uh, looking back at, at the events that occurred 150 years ago? Well, I, I'm still disappointed that Congress did not authorize a federal commission to direct curriculum programs and uh, official national acknowledgments, um, as they did uh, for Lincoln, which I co-chaired with uh, Senator Durbin and uh, former Transportation Secretary LaHood when he was congressman from Springfield. I think that was a mistake. I think that's a uh, an over an intentional oversight of historical memory that's almost unforgivable. That said, uh, maybe the state rights people have something going for them after all, because the states that have involved themselves in this have done a pretty darn good job. Um, Virginia has been spectacular, working with the Bud Robertson and Jack Davis and um, all the great scholars down there. A uh, series of wonderful events that have been held. I've been privileged to do one. I'm going to do another one in, in either 14 or 15. I don't even remember, but one more. Um, fabulously attended, looking at the whole spectrum from battlefields to um, to the home front experience to African-American experience. Um, it, New Jersey has done a good job, considering it had some famous brigades, but last time I looked, no battles. Um, and also New York, you know, which has a limited um, involvement, has a, a Civil War marker program and a historical marker program that's going very well. If I could express disappointment about one thing in New York State, and here's where you get some good, some bad. We did nothing to mark the 150th anniversary of the draft riots. And I think that's speaking about a seminal moment, probably the ugliest moment in, um, in um, New York history uh, when, uh, you know, race riots, not draft riots, um, that deserve to be remembered as painful as they were. And um, I think that was a disappointment. So, again, some states are doing very well. It seems to be in the public consciousness. C-SPAN, as always, doing a fabulous job with on-site commemorations and televising every Saturday uh, lectures the, from people that you, you, know, you can't hear all of them, but you can if you watch C-SPAN 3. So, and uh, the one other thing, the books have been, as the folks at Civil War Monitor know, the books have been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the outpouring is significant. The writing is terrific. These are no slapdash jobs. And most recently, Alan Gelzo's book on Gettysburg is a pretty wonderful read. And uh, um, uh, the new books on Lincoln keep coming out. So what I found is, in short, without the Federal Commission, there's still a lot of interest. So could be better, but it's not bad. Now, you mentioned this 
public consciousness and, and the fact that people are still very much enamored with the war 150 years on. I wonder if you might be able to speak just a little bit about, perhaps you could speculate as to why people still find so much to explore about the war. I mean, there's a reason they are putting these books out. People are still buying them. People are still exactly. reading them. So why, why is this still something that, that people find so much interest in? Of course, there's the old expression, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You know, if it's helped send my daughters to college, it's good. But, um, well, I guess because we haven't decided the outcome yet. Um, uh, that's what makes it so extraordinarily appealing to people is that the fight seems to not, it seems to go on. Um, during the government shutdown, uh, demonstrations in Washington, a Confederate flag was, was flown on the National Mall and waved at the White House. That indicates to me that there are still issues of national authority versus state authority, what that battle flag means to people of color and to white people that, that are still open questions. I'm not, I'm not agreeing that they should be, but just below the surface they are. So we haven't quite figured out the, the borders of uh, the country, you know, the, 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 the moral and philosophical borders, not the geographical borders, but the moral borders that we want to use to frame our society. So I think if we had, if the war had really settled all of those issues, it would be treated as sort of a quaint, if tragic, experience. But the fact that there are still people who think that uh, that uh, Mosby was a great man and uh, Lincoln not a great man indicates that the debate is still very li alive. And uh, I don't think any of us who write about the, the period want to shrink away from it, any more than the readers want to shrink away from it. Now, one of your most recent works uh, is The Civil War and 50 Objects. And right. I wondered if you could share a little bit uh, with our audience, you know, kind of w what that project was about and, and kind of what it entailed for you. At its most basic level, it's a book about a single collection, the extraordinary Civil War collection of the New York Historical Society here in the city, which has hundreds of thousands of Civil War objects. Um, in theme, it was a sort of a follow-up for the publisher on a very successful book of a few years ago called the History of the World in 100 Objects, written by my friend Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum in London, and based on its amazing collection. So uh, that, was the, the, that was the border. The, that was the project. Personally, to me, it was an amazing experience because I was working that summer on a young reader's book based on the Spielberg movie a little bit, you know, based on the 13th Amendment story. And I was busy, and they came to me with this project, the Historical Society and Viking Press did, and said, we'd love you to be the one to do it. It was the only chance, so I wasn't going to pass it up, so I sort of did two, two books in one summer while I was doing another book at the same time. That's, that's my problem. But let me just tell you one personal story, because I think you and, and your listeners will sort of get off on this. So they invite me to the Historical Society. And they, when I'm still pretending I'm undecided about this because I wanted to be wooed a little bit. Sure. And they said, we'll put out the objects. Some of the, we'll put out a hundred objects. You pick 50. And I, you know, 20 of them are on the wall. So I know what they are, but they're going to bring up stuff from the storerooms. So I go to the historical society to a conference room where there are three tables groaning with this material from buttons collected in prisoner of war camps to a, uh, a code apparatus used by Beauregard's secret code man uh, after, uh, after uh, well, during Manassas probably. Um, quaint items, a Civil War uniform, a Zouave uniform in perfect condition. And then, just looking more closely, a copy of the of Lee's surrender to Grant, signed by Lee and Grant, that was owned by Colonel Eli Parker, the American Indian aide to General Grant, uh, to whom Grant gave it after the uh, surrender. I didn't know it was in the New York Historical Society. And as I'm looking around at things that I didn't even know they had, a copy of the last issue of the Vicksburg Daily Citizen on the back of wallpaper, um, uh, a letter from Clara Harris, 
who was the young woman in the box with Lincoln at Ford's Theater the night of the assassination, writing to a friend just a few weeks afterwards saying, you know all that blood you've been reading about? It wasn't Lincoln's blood. He never bled. It was my fiancé's blood. He was stabbed in the arm and he spurred it all over the place. You know, all of those blood relics are probably fake, this letter means. Most amazingly of all, and this, if nothing else, had sold me on the project, there was a Treasury Department notepad. And on it, Abraham Lincoln had listed all of the states that he thought he would win in the 1864 election and all of the states that McClellan had won. And I thought to myself, this is Lincoln's version of the Tim Russert poster that he kept on, at, on, on the Gore uh, Bush Day, which is now in the Smithsonian, um, his path to victory. And by the way, he had him winning himself winning by one or two votes. He was conceding New York, Indiana, and Illinois, and still was looking for a path to victory. And this meant that you could feel Abraham Lincoln going to the War Department late at night, waiting for news of the soldiers, his soldiers on the battlefield, and maybe with a little spare time, jotting down what the commander-in-chief's political prospects were. So when I saw that, I thought, keep the fee, I'll take this object. But no, I had to take the fee. It was great, amazing just to hold that. I can only imagine. Uh, Harold, just one last question, and, and then we'll let you go. And that is uh, your current project uh, related to, to Lincoln and the press. I wondered if you oh, could speak works. just a little bit on that. Well, I've got one more chapter to do. So maybe by the time, even by the time this goes on air, um, I'll be done. Um, um, it's a story, um, actually, it, it's not a story about Lincoln and the press. It's a story about the press and Lincoln. I've constructed it as, the, it's called Uncivil Wars, the press and the, politics and the press in the age of Lincoln. And it really is sort of, with all apologies to uh, the masterful kind of style that Doris Goodwin has adopted of using, of doing joint biographies of people running and balancing them in your in your in your hands. I hope I can do it nearly as well as Doris does. But it's a story about three major editors uh, from New York: Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, uh, Henry Raymond of the New York Times, and James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald. Their intense competition for political and philosophical influence, Lincoln and Douglas courting them them courting and disappointing Lincoln. So it follows Lincoln through a series of newspaper competitions, all political, first in Springfield, Illinois, then in Chicago, then in New York, and then in Washington, but still built around the New York guys because they had the most influence and the most reprints. If that is hard to fathom, I hope the book does a better job. So it's the press, the political press in the age of Lincoln. And I've had great fun with it. I think People are going to be amazed at, A, how politicized newspapers were in the 19th century. We all complain, depending on our political outlook, about either Fox or MSNBC. Too conservative, too progressive, too Republican, too Democratic. Well, that's the way it was. That's the American tradition. But it's not only that they were politicized, it's that they were political. They were part of the political parties that they represented. Um, and I think it's going to be, I may use that phrase in the book, I like it, not just politicized, but political. They were part and parcel of the same well-oiled machine. It was all politics all the time in this country, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting story. Well, certainly sounds it, Harold. So, again, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us as we move towards the 150th of the Gettysburg Address. Again, everyone, it's Harold Holzer. If you haven't picked up some of his books yet, uh, I highly recommend that you do. And certainly, uh, Uncivil Wars, once it comes out, sounds like it's going to be quite remarkable, and perhaps we can have you on for an interview. So, Harold, thanks so much. Take care, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.